All right, so welcome everybody. Um, Tatiana is our speaker today. Tatiana is one of our uh, relatively new. Liberal a year faculty. old. A year old now. A year old. Okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> almost a toddler. Our first, our first year, post hire, I guess. Yeah. So uh, Tatiana has a, a clinical and research interest in pregnancy and liver disease, and Tatiana actually was a recipient of an ASLD award this year. She was looking at that, so congratulations. Thank Tatiana. you, thank you. That's really exciting. <laughs> and I'm uh, pleased to have her uh, give us a talk on pregnancy and liver disease. Yes. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jean, for the introduction and for inviting me to speak about liver disease and pregnancy. It's my favorite topic, so I'm happy to be here. Uh, for those of you who are at the board review course this weekend, there may be some overlap, but I tried to you know, update it for today. I think it's a perfect topic for the Day of Atonement, you know, for <laughs> uh, Okay. So, yeah, to start off, I wanted to mention about kind of the burden of uh, liver disease during pregnancy. What is the true uh, prevalence of liver disease in general during pregnancy? So there are uh, guidelines from the ACG, American College of Gastroenterology, which were published in 2016 for specifically liver disease and pregnancy. And they say that 3 to 5% of all pregnancies have some form of liver disease, but they don't provide a citation, actually. And so uh, the question is, is this actually true, and what is the prevalence? So one study that I found was actually a prospective study, not in the U.S., but performed in Wales over a 15-month period where they evaluated all women who delivered in their hospital OB unit. Um, and they had over 4,000 deliveries, and they found 142 with any uh, liver abnormality. So that's about 3%. Um, but then if you look at the liver conditions that they included, uh, many of them were pregnancy-specific, so preeclampsia was a big one, uh, cholestasis, hyperemesis, gravidarum. And then they also included only a few hepatitis C, didn't include hepatitis B at all, actually. And even with these uh, conditions described, they had 3% of all pregnancy with some form of liver disease. As we'll hear later, and as we're seeing with epidemiology, we're seeing a lot more hepatitis C in women of childbearing age, and also we see hepatitis B. So I do think that a, about a 5% rate of any liver disease during pregnancy seems appropriate, and I, and I think that's pretty high. So it's you know, a common presentation during pregnancy to have a liver abnormality. And this is data actually from the United States, and this is data that was published in 2015. And it looked at, actually, hospital discharge data from the nationwide inpatient sample. And so this is the largest national database which control, uh, contains information on all hospitalizations and hospital discharges. And keep in mind, this is hospitalization. So these are severe uh, presentations of liver disease that require hospitalization. And here we see you know, a list of diseases that is more representative of what we're seeing. So it includes hepatitis B, hepatitis C, uh, gallbladder disease is included because, of course, it can present with elevated liver tests, uh, as well as liver diseases specific to pregnancy and things like health. And what they found, they actually broke it down by three uh, time periods from 2002 to 2004, 2005 to 2007, 2008 to 2010. And actually, across the board, it may be a little bit hard to see the numbers, there's an increase in all of these hospitalizations for all of these liver-related conditions over time. Uh, I think it can mean one of two things. One is we're actually seeing more of them. Two may mean that we're just recognizing more of these liver diseases. But uh, what we're really seeing is that there seems to be an increase over time. And also what they found is that there's um, increased cost of care for a woman with uh, liver disease-related pregnancy hospitalizations compared to other pregnancy-related hospitalizations. So not only are these conditions increasing over time, but also they're associated with significantly higher costs. And so this is a big burden of disease. With the NIS, though, those 41 million, those aren't distinct patients, right? Those are hospitalizations. So they're the difference. Yes, definitely correct. So th those are. Uh, Pregnancy hospitalizations, so it could be, you're right, it could be the same person who had different pregnancies during that time period or same pregnancy, multiple hospitalizations, but yeah, that, that is a really good point. And it's from 2002 to 2010, so it's a long uh, time period, mm -hmm. but some of the drawbacks of using this yeah. in NIS, like you can't really make that distinction. Yeah, yeah. exactly. 
But I still think it's it's pretty striking that there you know is an increase in hospitalizations that these people are getting sick, and even with hepatitis B and hepatitis C, it's hard to imagine what they're being ad admitted for unless they're cirrhotic. But uh, they that that was what they found. So. Okay, I'm a little struck by the yeah. fact that if you liver disorders of pregnancy and then non-pregnancy mm -hmm. liver disorders, that they're kind of equal. Mm -hmm. You know, if you kind of add it up, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that's it's a little surprising to me. I would expect we don't think of uh, liver disorders of pregnancy as being very common. But it's kind right. of 50 50s. So yeah, but I do think they're the ones that are more likely to lead to hospitalizations. Like I, I actually can't imagine what you would be hospitalized with for hepatitis B or hepatitis C. You know, I guess you can have a hepatitis B flare. With hepatitis C, it could be cirrhosis-related complication, I suppose. But I do think that the liver-specific ones are uh, the the pregnancy-specific liver diseases would lead to would be more likely to lead to hospitalization because they're sicker. Yeah. So I'll I'll do a quick case presentation. This was in the board review course, so see if anyone learned something. But <laughs> so, <laughs> this was the easiest question. Then. So. This was a 29-year-old woman. She's referred to you at 25 weeks gestation because of concern for chronic liver disease. This is her first pregnancy and has otherwise been unremarkable. She's only taking a prenatal vitamin. On exam, her vitals are stable, but then you see that she has scattered spider angiomas across her chest, and then she also has significant lower extremity edema. And then um, on blood work, she's actually anemic, thrombocytopenic, and also her alkaline phosphatase is elevated and her albumin is low at 3.1. So what would be the next best step in men? So would you A, work her up for cirrhosis, B, refer her to a liver transplant center, C, MRCP for evaluation of biliary disease given the significantly elevated alkaline phosphatase, or D, provide reassurance? Does anyone, would anyone choose anything other than D? Okay, that wasn't a trick question. Yeah, so you know what, what's interesting about pregnancy is when you see pregnant women, they have many stigmata and uh, findings on both their physical exam as well as labs that remind you of cirrhosis, um, and that is largely a result of the high estrogen state leading to these to these findings. So it is important to remember, you know, we're in the liver field, but when we see these pregnant women, it's important to remember that they don't necessarily have uh, chronic liver disease and they look like this. So. Generally speaking, there are uh, some important changes that occur during pregnancy. One is that there is um, a rise in maternal heart rate and cardiac output and a decrease in systemic vascular resistance. So that's you know the physiology that we see in cirrhosis. Um, and uh, lower blood pressure as a result. But one important finding is that although the overall blood volume is increased, the absolute hepatic blood flow seems to be normal. So one question that we have been having is, you know, whether there's a role for fiber scan and elastography during pregnancy. And many people say, oh, there's higher blood volume, it would be inaccurate. But actually, I don't know if that that's necessarily true because it does seem like the, the part of the uh, literature that the absolute hepatic blood flow should remain normal. So something to keep in mind. And I guess the portal blood flow, yeah. like what's going on, like do the, the portal blood flow to me would be the most critical question. And I don't know yeah. what those uterine veins mean to, but. Yeah. We have enough pregnant women around to do this. Say it again? We have enough pregnant women around to do this. We have our own Yeah. Well, I mean, it's approved in Europe to do fiber scans on pregnant women, but not in the US. Um, so I haven't really been doing them, but I, I wonder if that is very interesting. I have a patient house today. Really? Pregnant. Yeah. For hepatitis B. And so what did you I do? basically said to her, I said, you know, I don't think you have, you know, in terms, but, you know, we should probably do a fiber scan on you after you're done with pregnancy. And I actually said to her, I think, you you know, we, we think the blood flow for the portal may, may be increased. Yeah. And so they meant that might over-exaggerate your nucleus. Yeah. Um, but I haven't found that. Yeah, that but I think I have to just base it on, you know, what we think about blood volume increasing in pregnancy, and that's right. really what I base it on. But it's interesting you say that. I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm a fiber scan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't fiber scan because it's not FDA approved, but. Yeah. Um, how do they like? How do they say that hepatic absolute blood flow volume is like? How do they? 
Exactly. You know, that's a great point, and I see it stated in like a lot of the review articles and everything, but I haven't found the original study where they actually measured. I, I should look and, and see if I find it, but you know, basically it's something that multiple uh, studies state, but I don't know what the original you know, data on that was. I'll take a look. And I'll let you know if I find it. But, um, and then, you know, the increased estrogen state leads to the spider angiomas, like in the case presentation, as well as uh, palmar erythema, even, you can see in pregnant women. Um, and then, of course, lower extremity edema is not abnormal to be seen in pregnancy. So then, the liver test in pregnancy, uh, so this is a list of the liver tests that we may uh, potentially check in a pregnant woman who presents with concern for liver disease. So, AST and AOT really should stay normal. Bilirubin as well should be unchanged or even slightly lower. INR and UDT should be unchanged. Alpha feeder protein, remember, could be quite high. So I have tried to screen for HCC with an ultrasound and an AFP during pregnancy, and then I was, you know, a little bit chapped, and I had the high AFP, but then you remember that they're pregnant. Um, and then alkaline phosphatase does, uh, is increased, especially towards the end of the pregnancy, and that's because of uh, release of the um, isoenzyme from the placenta, exactly. So, so that could be elevated, especially during uh, third trimester. And then hemoglobin and albumin are down due to hemodilution, and well, alpha protein is listed twice. Okay. So very important that elevations in transaminases, bilirubin, and INR are con uh, considered abnormal in pregnancy and really should be investigated. So, you know, sometimes you, you see a patient, like, their AAC and ALT are a little bit elevated, and you're like, oh, it's probably pregnancy-related, but it's not. <laughs> so you really should uh, investigate that further. Um, so this is from the uh, Pregnancy and Liver Disease Guidelines from 2016. And this is a, a nice uh, schematic of uh, how you should consider working up a woman who presents you with elevated liver tests during pregnancy. And just like we do with any other patients, you first decide if you have a hepatocellular profile of liver injury or a biliary profile, and that will guide you down the further workup. And so, hepatocellular profile, obviously, you want to think about viral hepatitis. In pregnancy, you do really want to think about HSV. So, when you have the inpatient consult on pregnant women, remember to send an HSV because that can have pretty uh, bad consequences during pregnancy. Uh, think about medications, although usually pregnant women are on less medications than others, and send the appropriate testing. If they have a biliary profile, uh, you really want to think. Uh, probably first and foremost about uh, gallstones. <coughs> and so you do want to get an ultrasound to look for cholelithiasis or cholecystitis or cholelithiasis. Uh, but then if it's just alkaline phosphatase that's elevated and the bilirubin is normal, no further workup because as we uh, just discussed, the uh, alkaline phosphatase uh, will normally become elevated during pregnancy. I want to that's true. That is true because it, it's true. It could be like a new presentation of PVC and yeah, agree. How about liver biopsy during pregnancy? Is it safe? Is it recommended? So the guidelines, uh, the ACG guidelines actually do have a line that says that uh, liver biopsy is safe and can be performed and basically do the workup as um, you know you would in a non-pregnant patient. So if a liver biopsy is indicated, uh, you should do it. But uh, actually, just last month in hepatology, uh, there was a study on uh, liver biopsy during pregnancy. And this is a nationwide population-based study in uh, Sweden. So they you know, have these large national databases with many, many patients. And they have almost 2 million uh, pregnancies that they looked at that did not have liver biopsies, and 23 that did have liver biopsies. So not very many, considering the, you know, the size of this cohort, uh, but they did find 23, and they basically looked to see if there were any negative pregnancy outcomes in those women who underwent a liver biopsy versus those that did not undergo a liver biopsy, and then they compared it to uh, different comparison groups, including uh, women without a biopsy during pregnancy, and then women with liver disease without a biopsy, uh, because obviously that would be a confounder if they didn't compare to women with liver disease. Um, and then they also compared to liver biopsy before or after pregnancy. And so what they found actually is that 
there were potentially some uh, effects on pregnancy outcome, although to me it doesn't seem that impressive. But uh, you know, when they looked at preterm birth, there was a trend towards significance, uh, but that was of you know, if you had a liver biopsy, there was an increased risk of preterm birth. But that was somewhat attenuated when they looked at uh, when they compared to women who actually had liver disease. So this may be the preterm birth may just be women with liver disease versus women without, realistically. And then they looked at small for gestational age, and they found some significance in comparison to both of these groups. And they looked at low birth weight and also found some significance. And then they say that one of their findings was that average women who did have a liver uh, biopsy gave birth 10 days earlier than the general population and six days earlier than women who did not have a liver biopsy who had liver disease. So, you know, published in hepatology, so they found it important. and. Basically, the conclusion was that potential risk should be weighed against the advantages of having a liver biopsy that may influence clinical management of the patient and fetal health. So I think this would make me pause, I guess, about doing the liver biopsy, but I don't know that I would, I don't know, has anyone done a liver biopsy in a pregnant patient? Yeah, how, how was that experience? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I also think if you do it earlier, like in first trimester or second trimester, it's probably I mean, yeah. yeah. I think it's fine as long as you don't get complications. Scenario is an early gestation by the patient that had acute liver failure. So she she also had a one of these uh, negative outcomes, but also probably because she was an acute liver failure, she had a right. like transplant. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I agree. It's interesting for me. The one person that we biopsied was someone who had acute liver failure. Mm. But again, the baby was in NICU, preterm, late. You know, like right things that we would see with someone who's really sick. Sick from the liver disease. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know if you can say it's the biopsy that did it or the fact that they were sick. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think as we'll see in the presentation, there's really very usually very little reason to do a biopsy during pregnancy. Most of these conditions you can diagnose without a biopsy, thankfully. And actually, in their, uh, in this article, they had seven that were done for hepatitis C. So that we definitely would not need to do uh, nowadays. So uh, they had two actually in here that were post-liver transplants, so I guess with a concern for rejection probably. So that would be an indication that I would see it. But um, otherwise, for the most part, hopefully we can avoid it. How often did it actually lead to a change in management? They did in this. I mean, I'm assuming if they found rejection, then they increased the immunosuppression, you know, and but then. The, the seven that were biopsy, perhaps C, like they could have just waited. Yeah. Well, this may have been a long time ago. Yeah. I mean, you know, but anyway, during that time, they probably couldn't treat during uh, pregnancy anyway. So, yeah. But uh, all right. So then. You know, when we think about liver disease, there are three main categories that are really helpful, I think, to think about when you have someone who presents to you with uh, liver abnormalities. There's liver disease that's unique to pregnancy, uh, and that includes the uh, liver diseases that are specific by trimester and timing during pregnancy. There's liver disease that's coincidental to pregnancy. Uh, coincidental may not be the perfect term, but basically this includes Liver diseases that can occur during pregnancy either with higher frequency or can have uh, more significant uh, or negative outcomes during pregnancy. So gallstones, I already mentioned, much more common during pregnancy. Drug-induced liver injury can occur, but Chiari, so pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state, so uh, it would be possible to see blood Chiari during pregnancy. The viruses, HSV is one that can lead to very poor pregnancy outcomes as well as hepatitis E. And then um, hepatitis A as well can occur. And then liver masses are important to consider because certain ones, specifically adenomas, are estrogen responsive, so can uh, become larger during pregnancy and rupture. So those are the ones that we really need to worry about. And then finally, there's chronic liver disease that uh, can present initially and be diagnosed initially during pregnancy or can be associated with a worse course during pregnancy. So there's hepatitis B and C, and those are the, really the ones that I'll focus on in this presentation. And then autoimmune hepatitis, which can flare uh, postpartum especially, 
Uh, so you need to make that diagnosis to know if they're, uh, and to treat them before that happens. Fatty liver disease, there's really not too much data currently on fatty liver disease during pregnancy, but as we're seeing more and more of it, we'll be seeing more of it during pregnancy. And then obviously alcoholic liver disease, PBC, which is more common in women and can present initially during pregnancy, Wilson's disease, hemochromatosis is probably less likely. And then obviously with all these liver diseases, you know, you need to consider how advanced they are and if they have cirrhosis, there are certain uh, considerations that need to be made in their management during pregnancy. So I'll start with liver disease that's unique to pregnancy. And so this is uh, that diagram bigger. So again, uh, what really helps you with the diagnosis is when it occurs during pregnancy. So uh, first trimester, the main one we think about actually is hyperemesis gravidarum. So that one is not really a liver disease per se, but is associated with uh, potentially very high liver enzymes. And then as we move to second trimester, we have uh, cholestasis of pregnancy, and then towards late pregnancy and the initial postpartum period, we have the preeclampsia health spectrum as well as acute fatty liver disease of pregnancy. So I'll just uh, go over the, each of them briefly. So we have uh, hyperemesis gravidarum. It affects up to 2% of all pregnancies. And it really presents typically early at around four to six weeks of gestation and really typically resolves by then the first trimester, so by 18 weeks. And the clinical presentation is really intractable vomiting. Like this is severe presentation with vomiting, dehydration, they often need admission for IV fluid and also can be associated with significant weight loss as well. The risk factors listed here include young age, obesity, uh, this being their first pregnancy, multiple gestation, and interestingly female fetus. And from a liver perspective, the liver enzymes uh, are often about 50 to 60 percent of patients who present with this, which is not insignificant. And they really could be actually quite high, up to 20 times the upper limit of normal. Um, ALT is u and AST are usually elevated, but ALT higher than AST, and bilirubin is rarely elevated. And the mechanism of why the liver tests are elevated, I, I don't think, for my reading, is very well understood. Uh, but, and also, but what we do know is that it's not associated with the subsequent development of chronic liver disease. So it's a condition associated with elevated liver tests through a mechanism not entirely understood, but does not pretend a risk of developing future liver disease. And the management is really supportive care with IV fluid, antiemetics, and vitamin supplementation. Okay, so I have another case. So this is a 37-year-old woman. She presents at 34 weeks gestation. So what trimester are we? Third. third, right. So third one is the one that we really get worried about. Um, and then complaining of three weeks of intense itching on her palms and soles of her feet. The itching keeps her up at night. She has mild scleroliteris. She's A no times three and has no asterixis. And then on her labs, actually, her bilirubin is 4.3 and her ALT and AST are almost 1,000, actually. And then her alkaline phosphatase is actually not too elevated. Platelets are 200,000. Uh, kidney function is normal. And then bile acids are 32, which is elevated. Her viral hepatitis channel is negative. You test in her for autoimmune liver disease. And uh, it's not, the ANA is not very elevated. And then the liver ultrasound that you got is normal. So which of the following would be the next step, next best step in her management? So A, deliver baby early at 34 weeks. B, test her for the LCHAV mutation. C, perform a liver biopsy. D, start ERSO. Or E, transfuse platelets with delivery. D, start ERSO, yeah. So I, I think what's interesting is that, you know, close based of pregnancy, we don't think of one of these severe ones that leads to liver failure, but the liver test, you know, can be really, really quite elevated. So it's important, and sometimes actually clinically I found that it's hard to make the distinction between cholestasis of pregnancy and acute fatty liver disease of pregnancy. Yeah. Now, in that case, though, the alpha-phosphatase really wasn't elevated. Yeah, it was, yes, good point. The alkaline phosphatase does not have to be elevated in cholestasis of pregnancy, actually, which is interesting. It's all about the bile acids. Yeah. Uh, so cholestasis of pregnancy can occur during second or third trimester, rarely actually also in the first trimester. Uh, it affects up to 1.5% of the pregnancies in Europe, but it's actually, it has geographical clustering and it's much higher in areas in Scandinavia, Scandinavia and South America. 
uh, specifically Chile and Bolivia. And uh, there are certain interesting risk factors. One that I'll draw your attention to is hepatitis C. So there is, uh, has now been found a significant association with hepatitis C with close days of pregnancy. So uh, important to remember that. There's also seasonal variation in, in the severity of presentation and some interesting other associations like low selenium levels, low vitamin D levels, multiple gestation, and advanced age. So this is a, a diagram from a, a nice review from The Lancet on pregnancy and liver disease. And basically, it demonstrates where the mutation occurs for this uh, for 15% of these cases. So not all of these uh, cases of closed states of pregnancy have a mutation there. But this is one of the biosalt expert pumps. And it's the multi-drug resistant uh, gene 3. And there are a number of mutations that can occur. And so if you're uh, heterozygous for this mutation, it's thought uh, that you can, that that is associated with 15% of closed states of pregnancy cases. Uh, if you are homozygous for those mutations, then you would have a more severe presentation. And interestingly, PFIC3 occurs in the same uh, uh, place. So, you know, that's why we see a, a geographic clustering and a, this genetic predisposition to this because uh, there, there has been found to be this uh, mutation that's common in these patients. Clinical features, so the keywords are uh, you have it, severe itching on the palms and soles of your feet. So these women really complain of itching on their palms and their soles, not, not necessarily like their belly, but on their palms and their soles, and it's worse at night. Um, Jaundice can occur, and importantly, it can occur not just during pregnancy, but also if they're on oral contraceptive pills. So uh, it's uh, estrogen responsive as well. Um, lab feature, so it's really based on the bile acid. So the bio, elevation of the bile acid is what you use to diagnose it, and there's an, there are different bile acids that you look at, and uh, an increase in the cholic to keno deoxycholic acid ratio is what is seen with, with this condition. And, Generally speaking, uh, moms do well, although this uh, can recur in future pregnancy. Uh, but the fetus can have poor outcomes, and that's why the bile acid level is very important, because uh, worse fetal outcomes are correlated with higher bile acid levels over 40. So if you have a woman uh, with bile acids over 40, then you really, really need to push the urso. Um, and then if the baby's showing any signs of distress, then early delivery may be necessary. But generally speaking, with close days pregnancy, the recommendation is to deliver at 37 weeks. So slightly early, uh, but then if there's fetal distress, you would even do it earlier. And then shifting to the hypertension-related liver diseases, so that includes a spectrum of disease. So there's preeclampsia, eclampsia, and health, which are all thought to be on a spectrum, although it's not necessarily true that you need to have preeclampsia and eclampsia before you develop health. And but they're thought to be in the same um, uh, spectrum of disease. So uh, preeclampsia, eclampsia is the more common one that we see among these diseases, and it occurs during second or third trimester, um, but can also occur after delivery. So it can present late. And uh, risk factors are older age, pre-existing hypertension, family history, and occurrence in a previous pregnancy. This is a... a picture from a biopsy, but of course you don't need a biopsy to make this diagnosis. It's a liver biopsy showing a type of coagulative necrosis that is seen. Um, because generally the clinical presentation and lab features are pretty diagnostic. So the clinical presentation includes high blood pressure over 140 over 90, and then proteinuria and edema, although actually edema is no longer required to make the diagnosis. So uh, if they're hypertensive and they have proteinuria, then you highly suspect it. These patients actually often present with right or uh, so that's important to key in on, and um, can have hepatomegaly as well. And then eclampsia occurs if they develop seizures uh, as a result of this, and so that's a more severe presentation. And liver test, the transaminases, again, could be quite elevated. Bilirubin is usually less than 5. And of course, uh, you have to look for the protein area. And then health is the end of uh, the most severe form of this spectrum of diseases. And uh, it stands for hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, low platelets. Um, clinical presentation is, again, right upper quadrant pain, uh, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, can again present postpartum. 
And uh, there are actually some classification systems uh, that help you with diagnosis and also severity. So the worse the thrombocytopenia, then uh, the more severe this presentation is. And you really have to look for signs of hemolysis, and that will help you make the diagnosis. So schistocytes, low haptoglobin, elevated LDH, and um, you, you really see, you see this microangiopathic hemolytic anemia that, that helps you make the diagnosis. The management for this, as, as well as for acute fatty liver pregnancy, is immediate delivery. Because the, once you deliver, then the whole cascade uh, hopefully stops, and then the uh, patient will recover. Um, and you know that you should recommend immediate delivery, especially if the pregnancy is already over 34 weeks and there's evidence of maternal and organ disease or fetal distress. And as soon as you diagnose someone with this, they really need closely monitored ICU care uh, because uh, it's associated with significant mortality, both maternal and fetal mortality. And, you know, the dreaded complication uh, of this is hepatic hematoma, infarction, and rupture. Uh, so this is a picture from a CT scan showing a very large uh, hematoma in a patient with this, and 50% uh, maternal mortality if this happens. Luckily, it's very rare, but a very high mortality. And uh, again, so if you see a patient with elevated blood pressure and proteinuria, and then they develop very severe, severe right upper quadrant pain, you, of course, would want to image them to look for something like this. Um, and if this happens, then the ALT-AST will be over 3,000, and uh, you have leukocytosis, anemia, and, and that would lead you to suspect that. For this, you know, if this does happen, obviously supportive care in the ICU, and then also potentially surgical resection of the affected part of the liver. Has anyone ever seen this? I, I've never had a patient with this. But it's a uh, yeah, very dreaded complication. Okay, and finally, the, the last uh, uh, pregnancy-specific liver disease is acute fatty liver disease of pregnancy. So this generally happens towards the end of pregnancy, third trimester, or early postpartum. It's very rare, luckily. Um, and there, are, again, are uh, risk factors associated with it. Interestingly, low maternal BMI is associated with um, fatty liver disease of pregnancy, which you would think is fatty liver that would have high BMI, but the association with low maternal BMI. And what happens is actually microvesicular steatosis. So this is the macrovesicular steatosis that we more commonly see. But uh, with this, you see microvesicular steatosis. And uh, basically, it's related to an inherited enzyme deficiency in the mitochondrial oxidation pathway of fatty acids. So this is where that enzyme is. It's the LCHAD uh, enzyme. And there's a in the, in the fetus, there is an enzyme mutation that leads to LCHAD deficiency, and that leads to substrate and its byproducts. And when those enter the circulation and go into the maternal liver, that causes direct toxicity to the maternal liver. So um, the thought is that the mother may be potentially heterozygous for this mutation, but then the fetus is homozygous, and then uh, it leads to a significant uh, deficiency that affects the mom mostly towards the end of the pregnancy, and the thought is because there's more reliance on the fatty acid oxidation pathway towards the end of pregnancy. Um, but, uh, yeah. And so clinical presentation with acute fatty liver disease of pregnancy actually could look very similar to HELP, uh, but they have really signs of liver failure and systemic disease. So they can present with pancreatitis, uh, renal failure, DIC, GI bleeding. Um, and uh, there is a criteria that actually helps make the diagnosis. So there's the Swansea criteria, which again, you know, helps you avoid doing the liver biopsy. Um, but basically, if the woman fulfills six of the following criteria, which include uh, clinical symptoms, uh, laboratory parameters, and imaging or biopsy uh, parameters, then they likely have acute fatty liver pregnancy, which I actually do find this useful in clinical practice, especially when we're trying to make that distinguish between uh, acute fatty liver pregnancy and health. I, I find this helpful. And actually, the one thing that I have found helpful is actually the ammonia level. So we don't routinely check ammonia levels, but with this, you know, I, I do. And then if their ammonia level is elevated, then that also helps me think about uh, acute fatty liver pregnancy. The management, again, is uh, immediate delivery, but liver transplant rarely is needed. So 
Actually, we, this year for ASLD, reviewed the SRTR, the National Database for All Liver Transplants, and looked at the number of transplants for this indication of fatty liver pregnancy. Not surprisingly, there were very few. There were about less than 25, actually. But, um, you know, some women just don't improve despite delivery, and so end up needing liver transplant. And they do well after the liver transplant. Uh, and then importantly, you know, it is associated with a high mortality, and the infants need to be screened for uh, defects of this fatty acid oxidation, obviously, because that's what leads to this whole sequence of events. And if they do screen positive, and it's part of the newborn screening, then they uh, have, you know, if it's severe, can have severe uh, presentation, including hypoketotic hypoglycemia, they need a special diet, and so need to be obviously closely followed. So this is a summary of the, the pregnancy-specific liver diseases and their liver test. So again, hyperemesis gravidarum in first, maybe second trimester, uh, significantly elevated ALT, AST, and bilirubin, full states of pregnancy, bilirubin, uh, ALT, AST, but high bile acid. So again, even though the closed states of pregnancy in many ways look like even health or acute fine liver pregnancy, if they have elevated bile acids, then that's closed stasis of pregnancy. And then uh, preeclampsia health, elevated ALT, AST, but with health really focused on the findings of hemolysis like LDH, elevated uric acid, and then acute fatty liver pregnancy, uh, elevated bilirubin, significantly elevated ALT, AST as well. And uh, and health? Well, you've got it down in preeclampsia and health. Yeah, both have low platelets, right? What's the, what's, what's the mechanism of that? I actually don't know that it's. I mean, it's DIC like picture. Uh, uh, so yeah. It's, so yeah. Yeah. it's not prior. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In both cases. Yeah, I think the mechanism actually of the low platelets is similar, from my understanding. So, like yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so moving on to liver diseases coincidental to pregnancy, it's a lot to cover, uh, and I'm more interested in actually talking about hepatitis B and C, but I'll kind of go through this quickly. Um, so biliary disease, the take home point is that it's common, that there are physiologic changes that occur during pregnancy, which affect gallbladder motility and natural production of these gallstones, leading to this presentation. And the important thing is that ERCP can be performed if indicated and cholecystectomy, but the ideal is to perform it during second trimester to minimize harm to the baby. Um, Biohepatitis, generally speaking, is the most common cause of jaundice in pregnancy. So it's more common that they have biohepatitis as opposed to one of these pregnancy-specific liver diseases if they present with jaundice. Hepatitis A can occur during pregnancy, and you can give hepatitis A immunoglobulin to the baby, especially with um, an acute hepatitis A. And then hepatitis E is more seen in underdeveloped areas in Asia, Africa, Middle East, not as much uh, in the U.S., but we're seeing more and more of it in the U.S. And if it does occur, especially in third trimester, it can lead to fulminant hepatitis and uh, really negative outcomes for the pregnancy. Um, but really, there's no treatment other than supportive care for hepatitis E because ribavirin, which would be a potential treatment, is uh, firmly contraindicated during pregnancy. HSV, I already mentioned, so, um, you know, the most important thing is to suspect it. So if the woman presents an elevated liver test, uh, check an HSV PCR and initiate uh, acyclovir early uh, because it's associated with, again, a significant uh, maternal mortality as well as fetal mortality. So uh, important to think of it during pregnancy. And, you know, the classic thing is it's anecteric hepatitis, so high ALT, AST with not, a, not very high bilirubin, uh, and that would be a time that you would suspect it. And then finally, uh, liver masses in pregnancy. Uh, you know, in women, we not uncommonly see benign liver lesions, so including hemangiomas and FNHs. Those are generally thought to be not as estrogen responsive, and so therefore, um, you're not as worried during pregnancy, but hepatic adenomas are, and so they really should be monitored for growth during pregnancy. And if they're over five centimeters, you should really consider resection prior to pregnancy if possible, because 
they can grow and then they can rupture during pregnancy. Um, you can monitor for growth with ultrasound during pregnancy. MRI can be performed, but gadolinium uh, contrast is controversial for use during pregnancy, so the preferred modality would be ultrasound if possible. And finally, chronic liver disease in pregnancy. So I'll just talk about hepatitis B and C, where I think there is more data and, and kind of uh, what I'm seeing more in my uh, clinical practice during pregnancy. So, you know, hepatitis B is uh, very common worldwide. And in the US, we see um, hepatitis B mostly in the immigrant patient population, so from Africa and from Asia. And um, if uh, it's acquired perinatally, which is still the most common cause of hepatitis B worldwide, then up to 40% of uh, babies born with hepatitis B will go on to develop liver complications such as cirrhosis or liver cancer. So uh, again, 90% of infants who have mother-to-child transmission will go on to develop chronic hepatitis B, and therefore it's very important to give hepatitis B vaccine and hepatitis B immunoglobulin to the infant, which decreases the risk of transmission significantly. And we also now know that the risk of transmission increases as maternal hepatitis B DNA increases. And so in terms of screening for hepatitis B during pregnancy, uh, back in the 1980s, the recommendation was for risk-based screening, meaning that women who have uh, documented risk should be screened, but otherwise not. But what was found is that this really was not uh, very effective in identifying all women with hepatitis B. And then as of 1988, universal screening was recommended. And since that time, uh, several analyses have shown that there has been an increase in recognition of uh, hepatitis B during pregnancy in the US, not surprisingly. And so once it's recognized, I already mentioned we give the hepatitis B immunoglobulin and the um, and the hepatitis B vaccine, but one area of interest has been whether there's a role for antiviral therapy during pregnancy to further decrease the risk of transmission. So this is one of the big studies uh, on this topic, and this was a prospective trial of 200 mothers who are all antigen positive with elevated HPV DNA, over 200,000. It was performed by Calvin Pan and published in New England Journal in 2016. And they randomly assigned these women with high viral loads to either uh, get tenofovir during third trimester or to not get tenofovir. And what they found in both their uh, per protocol analysis and intention to treat analysis was that uh, there was a significant decreased risk of transmission to the baby of hepatitis B when antiviral therapy was given in addition to the hepatitis B immunoglobulin and hepatitis B vaccine. However, a bit controversial uh, this year in the New England Journal was a study from Thailand, uh, which again was a multi-center double-blind clinical trial performed in Thailand looking at 330 women, and they randomized them to, again, to either receive tenofovir or not. Of note, in this study, the median time from birth to receiving their hepatitis B vaccine immunoglobin is 1.2 hours, so very impressive that you know, they had such amazing care that they got these things done so quickly. But what they found, actually, in their primary analysis is that there was no statistically significant difference in the patients who received tenofovir versus not. Uh, although the number of events in the placebo group was 3 versus 0, it did not reach statistical significance. So after this, there was a lot of uh, kind of controversy of whether like, our guidelines should be changed because we are currently recommending antiviral therapy. And actually, Dr. Nora Turo and Anna Lott wrote a letter in response to this saying that we still believe in our recommendation, that the study wasn't powered enough to detect the difference, and also the fact that they uh, received hepatitis B immunoglobulin vaccine within 1.2 hours is unrealistic, and it's good, uh, but uh, may not be happening in clinical practice, and why not use antiviral therapy if it can actually be helpful. So I agree with that. I think uh, you know tenofovir has been found to be safe during pregnancy. We have a lot of literature in the HIV world on it, and so if we can do anything that we can to prevent transmission, then then we should. And so generally speaking, during pregnancy, what we assess uh, we assess the mom uh, for their hepatitis B activity and uh, fibrosis if possible, and if they meet criteria for treatment, then uh, obviously they should continue the treatment even during first and second trimester. However, if they don't meet uh, criteria for treatment initially, then you test their viral load during third trimester. If it's over 200,000, then you initiate tenofovir. And this is one of the few indications where 
you can actually stop the tenofovir at delivery or within three months after delivery. Usually with hepatitis B, there's no stopping point, but this is one of the few indications where you can. Okay, well, what's the net number, the, the 200,000? I think, you know, the Calvin Pan study and then other Asian studies which looked at different viral load cutoffs may uh, found around that range to be associated with a, si a significantly increased risk of transmission. Yeah. When they stop, is there any concern that will be sort of beyond where it was before and cause this problem? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, discontinuation of antiviral therapy is definitely a risk factor for hepatitis B flare. And so if you do choose to discontinue, then you really do need to monitor these women closely because they can flare actually after delivery and their AOT will go up and viral load will go up. But technically, they, this indication for treatment is just for the purpose of decreasing mother-to-child transmission. So once you've accomplished that after delivery, then you can stop. But you do need to monitor the women very closely. So these are, these are women who are diagnosed with HPV during pregnancy. But how about those who have HPV going into pregnancy? Yeah, so the recommendation is really that if they have a chronic hepatitis B requiring treatment and they're already on treatment, then you should continue. The caveat to that is if they're on entecavir, I would switch them to tenofovir because entecavir is category C. The other thing, the new medication TAF that we have, uh, Vemlity, I, uh, it, it just not, hasn't been studied in pregnancy, so I prefer to use the reg, uh, Varia during pregnancy, although I know some people are using TAF during pregnancy as well. So actually, the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine came out with guidelines in 2016 for management of pregnancy, which includes the recommendation for uh, treatment, uh, specifically with tenofovir during third trimester. And all of this we already discussed, obviously, the HEPI vaccine HBIG, um, test the viral load during third trimester to determine whether antiviral therapy is indicated. Other recommendations that are OB-specific, um, no recommendation for a C-section versus uh, normal uh, spontaneous vaginal delivery. That's a question that you may get on consult, actually. Uh, so there is uh, no benefit to do a C-section. And then for invasive fetal monitoring and testing, you do need to counsel the woman at potentially increased risk, uh, especially if they have a high viral load. And then this is the question that you were getting at, the uh, question of hepatitis B flare. So pregnancy, due to immunologic changes, predisposes women to flare as it is. And it's especially increased if they're on antiviral therapy and then decide to stop at the end of pregnancy. So this is uh, several studies that were done on the topic examining how common are these flares and what actually happens. And the important thing to note is that, you know, yes, there are a number of studies. They have different definitions for what an ALT flare actually is. For the most part, they really weren't uh, very clinically significant, the ALT flares, and then it resolves on its own. Very few cases uh, that led to hepatic decompensation. But, you know, for example, this particular study looked at whether uh, discontinuing antiviral therapy early or late uh, or not, or women who were not on antiviral therapy at all, whether there was a difference. And yes, there was slightly increased difference in flares and those who discontinued early. But I think the key take home point is expect the ALT to go up after pregnancy, monitor them, but for the most part, uh, they'll do well. And finally, I'll end with hepatitis C in pregnancy. So. Uh, I think they've already had a talk about hepatitis C, but the epidemiology of hepatitis C is changing, and we're seeing a lot more reproductive aged women who have hepatitis C. It's no longer the baby boomers that are that we're seeing a lot of the hepatitis C in, but rather younger people, and which includes women of childbearing age. So this is a study looking at Kentucky and the U.S. overall in 2011 to 2014. And what they show is curves for women and their children. And what we see is that the, the top two are for Kentucky. We see a really significant rise in uh, incidence in, of acute hepatitis C in women, and then also paralleling that in children. And obviously, that implies that there's a risk of transmission, mother-child transmission of hepatitis C. Um, well, this is. I don't know why that, that happened. But anyways, this was actually <laughs> very bad. Uh, so this is a national study. It was in Annals of Internal Medicine, looked at the country overall, and also similarly found that there's a significant increase nationally overall in acute hepatitis C in uh, women of childbearing age. And as of 2013, it's much more common to see hep C in women of childbearing age as opposed to the older age group, the baby boomer age group. 
this is from the New York State emphasizing the same point. As we go from 2005 to 2012, we see the emergence of a new peak of uh, hepatitis C infection. The blue lines are female, which becomes more and more pronounced as we go on. And so uh, we're seeing a lot more in this younger age group. Why? Because of the opioid epidemic, uh, which is leading to a significant increase in infection. Uh, I'll skip this for now. So then what are the recommendations for screening? So the CDC and the American College of uh, Obstetricians and Gynecologists still recommend high-risk screening during pregnancy. So women that report a history of injection drug use or on hemodialysis and other risk factors are the ones that are being screened. But very importantly, very excitingly, as of May 24, the AASLD IDSA guidelines have officially recommended that all pregnant women should be tested for hepatitis C infection. So we have been doing that at Mount Sinai in the OB department since last summer, but now it's official in the Liver Society guidelines. That being said, this is our guidelines, and the OB societies are not necessarily on board, so I think that may take time, but that is uh, the official recommendation for us hepatologists. Um, you know, what has been found, and this is one study that's demonstrating this, is that Similar to hepatitis B, risk-based screening just doesn't work. Women, especially during pregnancy, don't like to report high-risk behaviors such as injection drug use, and it's very difficult to capture all these women with just risk-based screening. And also, importantly, hepatitis C is associated with a potentially negative pregnancy complications. So I already mentioned the intrapatical space of pregnancy but also higher rates of miscarriage, gestational diabetes, and premature birth have been described in this patient population. So it's important to know they have hepatitis C in order to uh, prepare for these things. And then, again, there's a risk for mother-to-child transmission. So this is a meta-analysis looking at uh, women with uh, hepatitis C antibody positive and RNA positive. And the overall uh, risk of transmission is about 6%, but if they're HIV positive, that almost doubles. And so this is not insignificant considering that with hepatitis B, we offer antiviral therapy with that risk, but with hepatitis C currently, there's nothing really that we can do to prevent transmission. Uh, HIV co-infection, higher hepatitis C RNA uh, levels, as well as independently maternal injection drug use are associated with increased transmission. And then uh, we still don't know enough, I think, about when the transmission occurs. So it's not that majority occurs peripartum, but uh, there's likely significant uh, transmission in utero as well. So when thinking about interventions to decrease that, we have to um, take that into consideration. And this is, again, from the ASLD IDSA guidelines. The recommendation is to know if mother-to-child transmission occurred, that you should test the child at 18 months of age with hepatitis C antibody. The reason for that is prior to that, uh, they can have maternal antibody. And so at 18 months of age, that maternal antibody wanes, and then they, you can test the child. You can also do HCV RNA testing earlier. Uh, and then in children, uh, many do spontaneously clear hepatitis C, but also uh, many go on to develop uh, long-term infection with chronic liver disease, as well as uh, what we're finding more and more that there are extra hepatic manifestations, such as uh, cognitive uh, deficits in these children who have hepatitis C. So I think uh, we're kind of running out of time. But anyway, these are pregnancy-specific uh, considerations when, uh, when taking care of these women. But generally speaking, you should avoid prolonged rupture of membranes. There's no benefit to C-section, and breastfeeding is safe. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So when we talk about viral hepatitis B versus C, it seems mm -hmm. like the impact on the fetus or the infant is more for the hepatitis C compared to the hepatitis B, and that might be based on the data we have that we actually have universal screening for that B and we're giving age big. But did they look at, I think one of the studies, like is it because they actually have hepatitis C or is it because they have chronic liver disease that impact, you know, that that determines the outcome or is yeah. it, you know what I mean? Like did they? Yeah, so there's one big study that looks at like just the having the virus leads to like premature ovarian senescence, so direct effect of having the virus, which led to these negative Outcomes and actually, what they found is treating the Hep C and curing it improved uh, in that cohort the rates of like prematurity. So I think it's something specific to the virus. The virus. Yeah. Um, okay. So 
one of our interests is whether there's any role for antiviral therapy for the prevention of transmission. And uh, the ASLD guidelines are pretty clear. There's no uh, recommendation. It's a red box warning. <laughs> Treatment during pregnancy is not recommended due to the lack of safety and efficacy. And the women should be treated before they become pregnant. However, this is uh, Dr. Dietrich published this uh, in Hepatology back in 2015, which showed that many of these rectally acting antiviral agents are pregnancy category B. So potentially safe to use during pregnancy. And currently, there is a phase one study going on in Pittsburgh of the use of Harvoni um, in uh, second and third trimester in pregnant women with hepatitis C. So I think this field is evolving. Uh, and, I, and I think that there's really a potential role for this to decrease moderate child transmission, uh, as well as to capture these women while they're actually seeing a doctor and engage in their own care. But there's a lot of opposition to this. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. I think I'll skip portal hypertension, and this is post-liver transplant, uh, which we really don't see many women who are cirrhosis and post-liver transplant. I haven't seen any this past year, but uh, important to know post-liver transplant that do not use cell sept, but you can use tacrolimus. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So I do want to let you all know that we have a women's liver clinic that we started this year, and this is Dr. Rhoda Sperling. This is Dr. Dietrich who helped kind of uh, uh, create, put this in place before I got here. And we see uh, women on Wednesday mornings in the OB department, actually, on the uh, E11, E level of 1176 Fifth Avenue, and also at Mount Sinai West. So if you have any women who are pregnant with, or not pregnant, but who, and who have any liver-related conditions, send them our way. All right. Great. Thank you.